Hi everyone, Raphael Harry here, and you're listening to White Label American, a podcast where we hear stories from an immigrant or two, sometimes more. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of White Label American. Thank you all for joining us. One of beautiful, lovely, and what I hope will be an enlightening episode with one of my favorite people on YouTube. And before we dive in, I would like to give a shout out to my Patreons. Thank you for your support. Hey, without you guys, we wouldn't be here. So keep the love coming in to our new listeners and our old listeners. Hey, you can always join in, you can support, you know, go to white, uh, go to Patreon slash uh, patreon.com slash white label American pod, P-O-D. So um, if you can't find it there, you can also go on Linktree slash white label American and you see the link to our Patreon page, join in. And yeah, we can always use as much support as possible because there are new things I want to do. There'll be some traveling, there'll be more content coming up. So yeah, you know, people I'm going to be collabing with down the line. So the announcements will be coming up by the end of the year. So you don't want to miss out. All right. So uh, today's guest is, like I said at the beginning, my favorite YouTuber. There's no, there's not um, an understatement. There's no joke. If you've been on her channel, you'll never be the same. It's like, you, you're just going to come out like, wow, this is, if, if you're going to get lost on YouTube, this, this is a place to go get lost on. So yeah, after listening to this, just go to Freedom Is Mine channel and go start watching you you, you know get your kids to watch it you, everybody should watch it this is is great because you know, it's the best one of the best contents you ever find on youtube i think that's why youtube um, exists because of this channel so today's guest is faida jela she's a youtuber she's an educator she's an activist linguistic and travel curator specializing in black history content from the global african diaspora she founded freedom is mine a platform dedicated to the celebrating uh, to celebrating the history, culture, and contribution of the African diaspora worldwide. It's a YouTube channel, and it's recent. You know, she found it recently. But I, I honestly, I, I thought this has been around for years, and well, this is one of the best things that uh, I, I, I wish it has been. It had been around from my teenage days. It, it would have helped me cover a whole lot of my ignorance, the problematic person that I was for for years. But I'm glad it's here now and I'm glad that younger people have access to something like this because it will um, it will save them from getting to my age when I started coming out of my uh, ignorance shell and, you know, catching up. So they don't have to wait until they get to their 30s. They, they come out of it now, you know. So with that being said, you know, before we dive into the origins and all that, welcome to the show, Faida. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I am just smiling from ear to ear after that. Very, very generous and high praise that you gave me, honestly. And I just want to say kind of on record that you've been such a, it's been so supportive and so encouraging. And as you say, it's still a relatively new channel. And obviously when we, the work that we do, and you will know this, there's, when we speak about Black history and Black communities, there's always going to be you know, haters and negative comments. So yeah. when you get people that are so supportive like yourself, it really shines through and it makes such a difference. So thank you so much, honestly. That was my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. My pleasure. It's an <laughs> honor to have you here. So let's dive to the very beginning. You know, before we get to your place of birth, um, can you break down the, the meaning and history behind your name? Because you have unique names, Faida Jela. Yeah, this is so uh for your listeners who don't know, I, I mean, you can hear from my accent that I'm British. <laughs> I gave, gave myself away. But um, so I am mixed race. I'm based in London. I'm half uh, white British, half Congolese from oh. DRC. My dad is uh, from Kinshasa. And uh, when I was growing, when I was, um, when my mom was pregnant, she really wanted to give me like a Congolese name. But my dad, he kept thinking of like colonial French names, Belgian mm -hmm. names. And my mom was like, no, like unless it's an African name, then we'll just call her something else. So my mom, she wanted to call me um, 
Frida after Frida Kahlo. Yeah. And then my dad was like, aha, Faida, which is Swahili. Ah. And it means, uh, <laughs> well, you can tell the kind of frame of mind my dad was in when he was in his mid 20s. <laughs> it literally means, as far as I know, it means like the interest that you get on your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> but it also means like a blessing a bonus like something positive that comes into your life so faida there we go wow Swahilina. wow i i would i i was not even expecting that to be um swahili i was literally thinking arab arab Arabic. yeah uh -huh. that, that's because yeah. well, well, i've been tempted to look up names in the past but i'm like no it, it feels more um i i enjoy it more when it's coming from the guests so i'm i'm i i, I don't give into the temptation to look up names but it's like your name faida if i were to be in nigeria back in the days when i was there growing up i would have said if i met a faida it's, it's not a name that i wouldn't i would have been shocked to see someone going by and i would have said yeah this is most definitely a, a someone from the muslim part of nigeria probably northern part hausa fulani so yeah. it's an Arabic influenced name. That that would no, have been my bet. I think because Swahili has like um, some Persian influences, doesn't yes. it? So maybe yes. Arabic came from there. Yeah. Because I have other women called like Faiza. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Or like Farida as well. Yes, Farida. Farida. Mm -hmm. Definitely Arabic influence name for sure. Yeah, Arabic influences. Uh, even because there are lots of Yoruba names. Like if you meet a Yoruba who's a Muslim. A lot of their names have Arabic influences, and mm -hmm. I've had two Yoruba on the on the, on the podcast. And when they, they broke down their names, that's when I started realize that wow, the, the names I just talked were Yoruba names were actually Arabic names. It was mm. the pronunciations that I was hearing that sounded based on the city that I lived in. I was, I think, I was in Ibadan, so it was uh, probably a Jebu mm -hmm. accent that I was hearing a lot. And or uh, Egba, uh, Egba accents, depending on what what part of the city you were in, and that was what made the name sound a lot more Yorubaish than mm -hmm. Arabic. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, so okay, so that that makes this not occur to me that that name was an Arabic influenced name, you know, or yeah, an yeah, Arabic yeah. name. So, yeah, it's and what, you know, my middle name is Aziza. Ah, yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely sound Arabic sounding, yeah, but yeah. Congolese, you know, Congolese names, but definitely that Arabic Swahili influence there. Nice. So what about your last name? Oh, good question. Jayla. So as far as I know, so that's my mother's name, my, my maternal side of the family, the British side. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, uh, we're actually of like Jewish heritage oh. and our name was originally Franks, Franks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had Russian Jewish ancestry. And somewhere down the line, one of my ancestors came to the UK and changed the name to Jayla mm. um, to avoid persecution. So yeah. I don't know too, too much about that side, like the, the, that side of the, the family, but that's what I was always told. But, you know, we get told these things in our family and then it could always be a lie. <laughs> so there's, there's that too. There's that too. Because the, the person I interviewed day for yesterday, um, she's a therapist and she talked about, you know, we talked briefly about families, you know, our immigrant families always have secrets. And they always have secrets or, you know, there might be one relative here, one relative there, just inventing small things. Yeah, it's it's, it's <laughs> like you have, you have to go dig deep. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. it, I wish they would just be open with things like this. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Jewish part, you know, uh, uh, someone I interviewed who was from Argentina, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, with, with this. Uh, he, he I've I known him for over a year and his last name is Charles. It never even occurred to me. And it was literally the same story that he gave of his family migrating to, uh, from Russia to, mm -hmm. um, to uh, eventually Argentina, but they, they stayed mm -hmm. in England briefly. And his, the way he said his was that they claimed they couldn't pronounce whatever your name was then. I, I forgot even what he said the name was, and it ended up being Charles. So they changed it to Charles. 
And didn't you say it was a similar story with your name of Ari? Yes, mine, mine, Ari. mine too. A lot of, but that that's very common. A lot of us, um, especially from my part, even uh, even on Ghanaian side, um, my my guest was uh, one of my first Ghanaian that I had on the podcast. He his grand uh, his his great was his great granddad who or his granddad changed the name, flipped the the middle with. Um, the last yeah. name. And then another guest too, he was Yoruba. He was the first Yoruba I met while I was in the Navy. And I couldn't place that he was Yoruba because it, just the names. I saw his name on the uniform, but I saw the, the marks, the marking on his face. And I said, huh, something is off here because his last name was Kennedy. And I was like, oh, Yoruba Puru is rare. Now, if he were from my part of the country, the Southern part, and his last name was Kennedy, I would say, yes, it's normal. Like I'm Harry. So, it's mm -hmm. normal to see us with names like that. Or if it was even a Spanish sounding name, Fernandez, you know, Silva, mm -hmm. it, it's normal. But Kennedy and your Yoruba, now something, were, were you I born in America know. or what? Is that your mother's last name? And he was like, no, that, that's, uh, I was born in Ibadan. I was like, Ibadan with a Kennedy? What family is Kennedy in Ibadan? Like, oh, <laughs> uh, my, my dad, my dad changed it when we moved to America. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sense. with with mine, it was the story I was given is that uh, the white man couldn't pronounce Ari, which is A-R-I, mm -hmm. just three letters. I think that should mm -hmm. have been easy, but uh, in school, <laughs> so they went with Harry. I was like, that's longer, but. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you would ever change it back? I've thought about it because I have uncles who are Ari and cousins mm -hmm. who go by that name. But in the end, I'm like... Not really. I, I don't see because there, there, there are too many of the family who kept that name. Like the, the ones, because we have the Ghanaians who never moved to Nigeria when Nigerians were kicked out of Ghana and mm -hmm. they stayed with their moms and became Ghanaians. Never. So they're not Nigerians. So they, they go by Harry. And, um, and we have the ones who also stayed in Ghana with their moms and go by Ari. So mm -hmm. I'm like. People just, I'm like, ah, if I'm to change my name, I'm changing it to whatever I want to change it to. I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I have a cousin who he found Jesus, I said that in quotes, and mm -hmm. he said uh, his interpretation of Harry was uh, the dictionary interpretation of the word Harry is a, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's an adjective or, or something. The word, as a word in, um, I think not an adjective, or, but it's considered a fool. I think it's a noun, but also, but it's considered a fool. But mm -hmm. as a name, it's a Celtic name. It's considered a rich, powerful lord. That's the meaning of Harry. But ah. there's a and it's, if you're using it as an, I think you can use Harry as a, as an insult. It's a fool. That's the interpretation he went and found after he said he found Jesus. And uh -huh. so the whole, he had a family meeting which people thought it was something big was going to be announced and a whole bunch of uncles showed up and you all, you all need to give your life to Christ. And this is, I'm like, this is a Christian family, but okay. And <laughs> you all need to change your name. I've changed my name. I'm go, you all should come. My last name from now on is Israel. I see. And, okay. So I, I've seen all that and I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. it doesn't... Yeah, I'll just keep my name. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I saw the fights that broke out after that. Like, are you serious? This is what you call me? Like, get, get get out of this family. Get out. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> like what what is what is this? Who you know? We all need deliverance. They need to pray for this family. We've been cursed. Yeah. And I was like, wow. I like the fact that he you know searched for the dictionary definition though. Yeah, yeah but I'd seen that as a kid, and. We also had a book of names that my elder sister had for some reason. And that's how I found out that, oh, man, our name, the last name means a rich, powerful lord in, mm. um, in Celtic and English. So mm -hmm. it was an English name. And I was like, okay. Um, so cool. whichever one you want to go with, you go with. But uh, I know I'm not a fool. That's not, <laughs> that's, it doesn't exactly. apply. So. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Raphael, which became Raphael after I moved to the United States. Um, that's uh, it's a Jewish name because it's Hebrew. Oh, I had yeah. no idea. Yes, it's Hebrew for uh, healing of God. Wow. Then, I always assumed, I mean, I guess there's a link there, but I was like, you know, Portuguese name or 
Spanish name. Yeah, uh, it, it, I guess with I guess Spanish Rafael is much more. Yeah, uh, it's 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 sweet on the tongue too. So. <laughs> 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 a little spice. Yeah, yeah, that's more spice. So that, that's why I don't complain when people call me Raphael to the extent yeah. that even the day I was in public waiting for my name to be called and a gentleman who was from Costa Rica called me. I was like, Raphael, Raphael, Raphael Harry. And I'm sitting there. Mm-hmm. And mm. I was like, oh, you calling me? It's like, you don't know your name? <laughs> like, oh, everybody calls me Raphael. I actually lost the first job I applied to in the United States because... They, they, when they called me and I said, my name is Raphael, they were like, Raphael? I said, Raphael? Raphael? I said, Raphael? Uh, the guy spoke, said something in Spanish and I was like, well, um, yeah. no, no hablo espanol. And oh. he said, oh, sorry, we, I, I, the job is taken. I was like, what? Where you uh, called me? So that's how I lost the job. The Spanish speaker. Yeah, but I think they saw my name and they saw Raphael. And that's mm-hmm. what they went with first. And then when the moment I said I'm not a Spanish speaker, they wanted they could have just said that that's what they wanted. But that technically was I could have sued for that. Yeah, you could have. But sure. I didn't even know about job discrimination then. So I was just okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. It was, it was later I told people, people were like, oh man, people are getting mad. And I'm like, why are you getting mad? Like, and then I was like, oh, it's all right. I wouldn't have even wanted to walk there in the first place, so it's, <sighs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's why I love asking about names. There's so much mm. you, you find out. There's so much history and connections that we have through names. Wow. So, so yeah, I, I see another reason why I like you a lot because myself and people from uh, people with Congolese connections, it's like, yeah, we, we, we get along so easily. We, we get yeah. Al- yeah, we they, um. The first music that I grew to as a kid was Congolese. My mom had lots of records. And I never realized they were Congolese um, music, like Papa Wemba oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah. So, you have to get those hips going. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, That's oh. when you always, you always know when you see Congolese men dancing because those hips are going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, my tribe does hip dancing, but they're in front of boys dancing, young boys. So it's like complicated. You know, yeah, <laughs> and it's, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole different topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, return back to you and your story. So, um, let let people know your place of birth and what your childhood was like. So, I was born in London, and uh, my childhood was, you know, interesting in that obviously I have my mom who's British, who I was living with, and then. My dad, uh, Congolese, who I wasn't living with him, but obviously, you know, that influenced me from young. And then actually, when I went to high school, I went to a boarding school for seven years. So I think that kind of influenced me as well. Um, And then from there, I was just really like nomadic. Well, I mean, I studied and my degree was in uh, modern languages, Mm. speaking of languages. And then from there, I, that's when I just started my journey of traveling around all these different countries, um, predominantly in Latin America. I also spent some time in France um, and just, yeah, like just, you know, trying to get to know those those different countries and different cultures on the ground. And that's kind of what cemented my interest in African diaspora communities because I would be traveling around these places and then be seeing, you know, black people or people would see me and just assume that I was from there. And I think it speaks to what you were saying earlier about oftentimes when we see like, you know, uh, I don't know, when we think of other European countries or we think of Latin American countries, we always think of white faces. Yeah. Um, And so for me to go around and be seeing, you know, black French people or black Peruvian people or, you know, black Mexicans. To me, that was crazy because I was like, I never even knew about you guys. That's true. It um, is. And it so is. to me, that was really fascinating. And I think that really kicked off my interest in the African diaspora community as a whole. Mm-hmm. It made me really kind of reevaluate my own ideas of blackness and what blackness looks like. Um, and it really kind of, you know, bust that wide open in the sense of black can be anything like you can be, Af- you can be black and you can be Polish, you can be Iranian, you could be Russian, yep. you could be, you know, from, from South Korea, 
Like, honestly, that's true. To me, it was just, yeah, that kind of kicked off my fascination with our global community and our global history as well. Yeah, that's right. Global history. That's, 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 that's the, yeah, those are the words that um, should mm. go with black history because too many mm. times people just equate black history to America or Africa. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. UK. And, you know, it's kind of like, when I just met my missus, she's from Germany, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, let me try and impress her with, like, knowing some... Because I, I knew a, little, a few things about Germany. I loved watching Bundesliga, so that's just one way I got our conversation going because we met through Tinder. So, you mm-hmm. know, like, when she said German, I was like, oh, are you one of them Americans who just say, I'm German-American? I'm like, well, <laughs> there we go. But uh-huh. when she said German, I was like, ah... Uh, what where in Germany are you from? And she's like, Where do you know in Germany? I was like, Give me one big the big city in your area. And she said, Dortmund. I was like, Oh, that's my favorite Bundesliga team. And she's like, Okay, this person is different. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Yeah, I was, when they won the Champions League in 997, yes, that was a great moment. And then yeah, I was like, okay, okay, okay. You don't don't, don't go too far. I, 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 I'm I'm not too big in the game, but yeah. I was like, okay, okay. She was like, okay, you Read it back a bit. Yeah, yeah. So you charmed her with your knowledge. Obviously, it worked. Yeah, but it was like, okay, after that, I was like, let me increase my German knowledge. I I, I downloaded um, Deutsche Welle on my Fire Stick. And mm-hmm. luckily for me, they had Afro in Germany documentary about mm-hmm. the play within a day or two. So I was like, oh, let mm-hmm. me watch this documentary. I wonder what it's about. I thought it would be about uh, the black people in Germany in modern times. And mm-hmm. they went on to show that black people from what they could show just in that documentary, the, the, the records that they have, they had records of black people being in Germany for over 400 years. Yeah. And that's when it, it occurred to me, like, wait a minute. You know, I've always thought about, oh, maybe they started showing up after, you know, in the, maybe like 60s, 70s, that's when black people, well, why wouldn't black people be there for like 400 years? That, it made more sense. It made plenty of sense. And even during the time of the Nazis, they were showing videos of black people all around and black people ex- yeah. talking about wanting to join the, the SS. Um, mm-hmm. And all that was, then it was, it just changed my whole perspective. And I was like, you know what? Black history isn't limited to just one place or two places. It's yeah. global. And that's, that's the right way to describe it. It's global. And since then, it just, that's, that's why when I came across your channel and I saw that you, it even expanded what I knew the, the, the little already got at. And I was just like, yeah, this is this is why this is very important. So, yeah. I would um, love to give your listeners a, a Afro-German fact. Yeah. If I may. Sure. Um, which is that the first uh, documented African man to attend university was in Germany. His name was Anton Wilhelm Amo. And there oh, is wow. a street named after him in Berlin. And he was an amazing scholar. He spoke uh, so many different languages. He studied so many different things. And um, yeah, a really incredible guy. So if your listeners are interested, then they should look up Antoine Wilhelm Amo. Antoine uh, Wilhelm Amo. Yes. I apologize for my horrendous German pronunciation. <laughs> oh, you, got, you, you, you dropped information that I don't even think was in the Deutsche Vela documentary because I don't recall seeing mm. that in there. Well, wow, yeah, no. I didn't even know that. Wow. Amazing individual. Yeah. Uh-huh. See, that, that's another reason why I, I, I had to bring you on the podcast because you know, <laughs> we, we, we add more knowledge to, you know, I, I see I don't know enough. So I'm, I'm a sponge. I'm, I'm just soaking in stuff. Oh, but, you know, let's return back to your childhood. Uh, one quick question before I go mm-hmm. to the main question I wanted to ask. Uh, what part of London were you born uh, into? So I was born uh, South London, so kind of, you know, Camberwell. I don't know how well you know London. Not really, but I just like hearing names and your people in the yeah. UK who listen. So also. an area called Camberwell um, in South London. Okay. And I was born in St. Thomas's Hospital, which looks out onto the River Thames. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've, I've gone over the River Thames. Yeah, at least exactly. twice. So, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe three times, but at least. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, Opposite. Opposite. Uh-huh. Big Ben. Big Ben. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was too much. I was in too much of a rush. So I didn't get to stop and take the obligatory photo of Big Photo. Big ben. Yeah. Next time I'm in <laughs> London, I'll do that. Yeah, for sure. 
All right. So, um, going back to your childhood, what do you consider your favorite childhood memory? Then you, you could share more than one memory. This is such a good question. Um, so I think, I don't know if I have a specific memory, but when I was younger, my, my mom and my auntie, whose husband is Nigerian, by the way, um, they, we always used to go to like festivals in the summer and we always used to, we would just take our tents and we'd go camp out in these fields and they have like music and food and it was just really incredible. And I don't know if that's kind of an experience that a lot of people have growing up, but for me, it was just amazing to every summer we would just, I mean, I don't love camping, <laughs> <laughs> but as a child, you don't really care, do you? Yeah, so, you don't. <laughs> yeah, we would just go like a week at a time and every summer we would go and it was really amazing to me. So, so um, I don't love camping either, but my mind is a, it's a weird reason because I, I think I said it on, on my YouTube, on, on my IG live. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because of, uh, I watch too many crazy movies on the, the wild animals. Yeah. So, yeah, when I was younger, so it, <laughs> it, it messed me up. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason why I can't do camping. <laughs> No, me neither. I wouldn't voluntarily do it now, but yeah. those were different. Times. I mean, I, 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 I hike and come back the same day, but yeah, no, no, don't, don't keep me camping. Like, uh, yeah. You know what that's called? That's called glamping. <laughs> that's what it's called. Glamour camping. Glamour camping. Oh, okay. Yeah, glamping. Glamping. glamping that's right? when you when you camp during the day and then you go back to your hotel. <laughs> Sign me up for that. I, I'll yeah. do that. I'm, I'll go bougie. I'm bougie yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going to the summer festival with your um, mom and aunt, um, yeah. did, did your Nigerian uncle come along? Oh, yeah. He was in charge. He was responsible for, you know, make get the fire going. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All of the, like, manual things that we yeah. needed doing. To help <laughs> us, you know, put up the tent, things yeah. like that. He was really good for that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. So that sounds like um, a memory that, in a way, spoke to your adventurous spirit. Mm, very good observation. I hadn't thought about that, but it's true. Yeah, that's why I like asking this question because a lot of times guests don't even think about it. Whatever memory they pick, it in a way yeah. still relates to what you're doing in the, in the present. Yeah. Now you sound like a, like my shrink. You're going to start charging me for your time. Yeah, I should. I should. <laughs> <laughs> I, I accept pounds sterling. I accept dollars. I accept, um, uh, well, Bitcoin. Venmo. Maybe. Yep. 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 Just um, Venmo me, PayPal. And, you know, I mean, we, 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 we are friends. You know, I, I, well, yes, we are friends, but we can I, I accept friends like Jeff Bezos type, you know, just send me that. Yeah, money. yeah, a little side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but maybe it's... I should cash in on this with you and take a little, you know, five percent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love to share, so yes, sh sharing is caring. <laughs> I don't, I don't plan to keep it all to myself. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, no, it, it's 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 so beautiful that uh, every time I ask this question, it's it's not like intentional, but everybody I think just goes with something that speaks to you know. Everybody goes for something that made them happy. And mm. I think even one person had given something that was a little bit, um, there was a moment of trauma, but in that moment mm. of trauma, they found a little joy. And that mm -hmm. even from that moment of joy, it still spoke to a, a personality traits that makes them stand out today. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, it's not like that was the main, that was the goal of this question, you know, but mm -hmm. it's just a question that I just felt like well, you know, this might be one of the questions that I will keep for every every guest, and I yeah. just throw it out there. And it's something that it always brings out something different every time I ask it. And but yeah, yeah. at the same time, it still brings the same result in a way, if I may put it that way. You know? Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, I think you made an excellent observation. Maybe that is what um, inspired my adventurous spirit because I've always traveled alone. Mm -hmm. Ever since I was 19, I just said to my mom, I'm going to France. Yeah, see? <laughs> and see? she was like, okay. Wow. Um, and just moved to France. So yeah, I think I think you're definitely you hit the nail on the head with that one. I wish I wish when I was 19 I could have done that. Because I was I was a lot I was yeah, I was scared. 
I put up, I was the guy who was like, I ain't never scared. Play that song. I never scared. <laughs> we don't get scared of nothing. And then, yeah, I'm like, uh, you want to go with me? No? <laughs> uh, men don't get scared. We don't get scared, that kind of thing. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm going to be 40 next year. And then it's like, yeah, I, I was scared. I just, I'll just, just be honest. No, no, to be fair, I picked France because it was like the nearest country. <laughs> hey, not, not too long, but you, you started. You started somewhere. And, yeah, you know, we had to I, start small. A, a, a lot of us were like, mm, you know what? I go to Lagos. Yeah. I could have gone to Cotonou. <laughs> Right across the border, you know, and I was like, oh, this, nah, we're better than them. <laughs> there are different ways. <laughs> we, like, yeah, we, we're superior. Like, yeah, I did that too. Yeah, there were different languages that we used, but at the end of the day, there was fear. So I was like, mm -hmm. wow, well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know anybody there. Mm -hmm. I wanna, it's not, I'm not gonna explore, no. So, it was, but fear was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. A big was, factor. Yeah, That's big natural factor. though, fear of the unknown. Yeah. But, um, I think it's actually a really good thing. I mean, for us to put us push push ourselves to the edge of our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. So, before you made that trip at nine at age nineteen, mm -hmm. um, was there any um, during your teenage years? Mm -hmm. Was there any time you were considering being something else career wise? Career wise, I mean, I. Dare I admit it now, I still don't really know what I'm doing in life. Hey, ain't, ain't, ain't that the best part of it? <laughs> yeah, I remember when we were at school, uh, we had to do one of those like career career tests. Did you mm. ever have to do this? Where they, it's like you write down your interests and then they, they put it in a computer and then tell you what they think the right profession for you is. Oh, our, my, ours was, a, was uh, there were no computers then. I was in Nigeria, so uh, back then, and there were, mm -hmm. so somebody would tell you, like, uh, yeah, you're not good for science. Go, just, just go, go <laughs> yeah. Really? Go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No room for discussion. Yeah, no, no, it's not even enough. No, no, it's not for negotiation. Just go there. Yeah. <laughs> no science for yeah. you. No science. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I would have loved someone to tell that to me because they made me, science was obligatory for me. <laughs> um, oh, you still yeah. have to take science in the final exams, but your your career path was like, you can't, don't even, don't dream of anything science. You, 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 you <laughs> failed your family, you failed your community, you failed your society. Go, go start becoming dreams. a teacher in, um, to <laughs> teach social sciences, uh, teach, uh, no, not even social sciences, go teach, um, Home cooking, teach, and they, they talk down on all that, and then you're like, oh, yeah. man, I, I mean, it sounds pretty similar to the experience I had. I mean, they <laughs> said they put it in a computer. I'm not sure mm -hmm. they did, but my form came back saying that I should work in agriculture, and I was like, I don't know what on earth you interpreted <laughs> from my answers that I should work in agriculture, but uh-uh. So, um, yeah, I think when I was a teenager, I was always interested in journalism, um, and I was interested in languages as well. Wow. So maybe combining those two things but as I got older I thought you know maybe I'm not because you have to I mean at least in the UK I'm not sure what it's like in Nigeria or in the States um but you in order to be kind of like an accredited journalist you need a certain amount of qualifications mm -hmm. um which implies like a certain amount of years of study and also money yep. <laughs> yep. to me I was like no let me just do things let me come at it sideways and so I just decided to you know travel and to do my own research um, and so now I do work as a researcher, a documentary researcher, um, freelance. So I always was able to kind of like hone that inquisitive spirit um, and channel it into something. But yeah, I still wouldn't say that I have it all figured out <laughs> at all. Hey, that, that's the beauty of, um, you know, being on the journey and being um, recognized that you, you're on a journey. Because I, I, I believe if if you have arrived, then that's when you're like, yeah, I'm, I've figured everything out. Then yeah, there's yeah. nothing more to change. There's nothing more to adapt or, or there's no more room for growth. But yeah, which room, no one yeah, should ever say. Yeah, that, you know, that, that, that's how I see. That's why you know, I, I think there were, there were things that now I can look back and be like, yes, this was one of those things that was happening and we didn't get it. Yeah, we were teenagers then and being boys, you know, and in a very, uh, um, um, uh, patriarchal culture that was like, yeah, you always be on top in a way. And it, there were times when we saw, I remember one of my neighbor's um, granddad, 
he was 80 years old and mm -hmm. he went to take the university entrance examinations so mm -hmm. he could go back to university. It's not like he was an educated man, but he had retired and everything and then he wanted to go back mm -hmm. to university. And he took the yeah. exams and he passed and we didn't pass our exams. So we we're like, oh man, this 80 year old man passed. And But <laughs> I don't think, it wasn't about him taking the exam to pass. It was about him saying his journey wasn't complete. Yes. So yes. he's going to find a new path for himself. Mm -hmm. And we didn't understand that was what was happening here, but we were looking at it more as he's putting shame on us. Oh, he's taking the exam. So we're, so we're <laughs> angry and all that and jealous. And we want to show our face around this man yeah. or we'll ask questions, you know, tap into his knowledge and all that because we're yeah. embarrassed. Not everybody mm. could pass the exams because, the, to, especially if you wanted to go to the best schools, the cutoff mark was high. So not many of us didn't fail. That's the thing we didn't understand that we weren't failing. We just didn't meet the cutoff mark, which was yeah. very high. So, but we, in our interpretation, we failed because you had to come home and say, I did not meet the cutoff mark. So that's a failure. But if you had mm. chosen a school in a much further part of the country, you definitely met the cutoff mark and you passed. Mm. So that fear yeah, of wanting to travel, it. yeah. You didn't want now to you talk about it. The lesson that he he taught you. Yes, yes. Now I, I can over well mm -hmm. over twenty years later, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> we know that's a great story, and you know, just goes to show we never stop learning and mm -hmm. never should stop learning. We no. should always be no. knowledge. Yes. So, um, you made your first trip at um, age nineteen. Mm. What was the? Do you remember your first culture shock? culture shock uh yeah um I mean I wouldn't necessarily say it was a massive culture shock going to France in the sense of it's still another European country yes but the following year I went to Mexico for almost a year um, all right let's just focus on Mexico because that, yeah that's yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's much more juice <laughs> in that one yeah. hey, more juice arriba <laughs> so yeah I went to Mexico for a year to teach English to adults it was as oh, wow. part of my degree um, so I was writing my dissertation at the, at the same time, but I was also working and um, I was young. Like most of my students were older than me. Yeah, so that, that, yeah. it was a really interesting experience. I mean, culture shock, most definitely in the beginning. I was not ready <laughs> psychologically. And I've never felt because being in the UK, I don't feel particularly British. Mm -hmm. Like I feel, you know, that I have like, the black culture, African culture. I have close proximity to Caribbean, like so many different cultures, but I don't feel British being in the UK. And then as soon as I stepped outside and I went to Mexico, I felt so British. I was like, <laughs> I really see myself as British now. But um, yeah, it was just, it was a great kind of, it was a steep learning curve, but a great lesson in really adapting to other cultures and to uh, having understanding and patience yeah. and also being grateful for being taught like a different way to do things or a different way to see the world mm. and one of those was for me especially was um because I was working but obviously doing my dissertation concurrently and my dissertation I wrote it on um attitudes towards death and dying in oh, Mexican wow. Mexican mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. and obviously you know of like day of the dead yeah um which is a two day celebration um, on the 1st and 2nd of November every year. And so to me, that was incredible because the day of the dead. So the 1st of November is for angelitos or like children, basically anyone that's died in like innocence. Um, and then uh, the second day is for adults. And it was just so that they have these amazing kind of like ceremonies and rituals and customs around death and around honoring people that have died. And I think to me, that was a huge culture shock because I mean, um, quite possibly very, very different in different, you know, Nigerian cultures. But in the UK on the whole, when someone dies, we don't really have, apart from the funeral, yeah. we don't do anything like, we have no ceremonies. We don't do anything ritualistic to remember them thereafter. So, you know, we might not even speak about a person too much after they passed away. But in Mexican society, it's like every year there is a dedicated you know, religious festival in which people make a point to remember their loved ones who have passed away. And it's almost as if everyone, everyone knows someone who's passed away. 
um and we we are all i guess ultimately like kind of connected by death in a way because we're all gonna die and so to me that was a huge culture shock because it's like we never do anything like that in the uk but i actually think it's so beautiful and so poignant and really healthy <laughs> yeah really, really uh, healthy yeah it is really healthy um in in the, most of my experience in nigeria uh I think it was because I was also very religious for a long, for quite a while. And mm. I think that played a part in how we dealt with death. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really talk about it. We, for the most part, to my knowledge, it's always, yeah, if there's a big funeral, depending on where you are or your status mm. in life or the economic ladder and mm -hmm. so your funeral could be from seven days some places two weeks two weeks yeah it's, uh, i have I have an issue with that because some people some of those people you didn't do anything for them when they were alive and then when they die mm. you have like a huge carnival over the, mm. i'm like you could have saved kept that person yeah but that's a whole conversation mm -hmm. but uh mm -hmm. I hear you. As soon as the person gets you know into the ground, it's official. They're done. It's done. You know, and then they go move to the next level of uh, dividing property. If they have properties, the, the whole fight mm -hmm. and about that. And then after that, it's like you you you're done. It's over. And mm. to show even how we don't really talk about death, uh, what I consider the largest killer in Nigeria is uh, brief illness. We we don't even talk about it what killed the person in the first place. So it's yeah. like all our newspapers, you see brief illness, so they died after <laughs> a bout of brief illness. Uh, on the TV, brief illness, killed this person. Yeah. Brief illness, brief illness. So that's... Well, really, even yeah. on TV. Yeah, TV, radio, brief illness. So it's kind of why, even with this pandemic, there are lots of people who don't believe that COVID is real because you don't know who died from COVID, except mm -hmm. for some um, senior officials. That's... Another reason why uh, I, I have huge respect for Fela's family, because when he passed away, they could have done that same thing that most Nigerians do and say he died of brief illness. Mm. But they made it open that he died of um, AIDS. Mm, and mm -hmm. that was one yeah. way many people got to take AIDS seriously mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. country. Oh, really? Yes, because you know Fela's, you know, you know who Fela was. You, many people mm -hmm. knew him. Maple didn't yeah. like him. Now he's cool. Everybody likes because of oh, Bonaboy and all that. Everybody, but but nope, it's like Martin Luther King. People didn't like him. People didn't support yeah. him. Yeah. But everybody knew who he was. And mm -hmm. seeing him, that seeing his family say this is what killed him. This is what led to his mm -hmm. death. Changed mm -hmm. the conversation. But we don't do that for most. Like even Abacha, the military tyrant that ruled us, what killed him? There's just rumors. Oh, it was in an apple that he was giving. They said it was poisonous apple and all. You hear those rumors, but they, they don't tell you what exactly. We still don't know how to talk about death, yes. except mm -hmm. if there's a there's a fight between maybe there's multiple wives or there's fighting over property. Then you start hearing conflicting stories. So mm -hmm. we don't really have the habit of talking about death. Well, all we do is a religious um, ceremony bury yeah. the person over move on and, and yeah that, that that's it so that, that's why i always uh admire the mexicans seeing how mm -hmm. they, they embrace theirs and yeah that that is something that is, is a natural thing it's a natural thing it and comes, it shouldn't be yeah it, we shouldn't hide <laughs> from it we shouldn't um, exactly exactly yeah. and even like you know in mexico during that festival when i was observing people will go to cemeteries they'll go to the tombstone of the mm -hmm. person They'll, have, they'll bring food, they'll bring flowers, they'll bring yeah. alcohol, they'll sing songs, they'll dance, they'll celebrate. Um, and, you know, in the house, um, everyone will have an ofrenda, which is like an altar. Yeah. And they'll put a picture of the person, they'll put things that they would have liked, whether it's like, you know, a pack of cigarettes yes. or, you know, a shot of tequila or whatever it may be. They'll put things the person liked. They'll, they may even set a place for them at the table mm -hmm. when they sit down to eat yeah. and it's like a very conscious acknowledgement of 
and the celebration of the person's legacy. And I just think that's really admirable. But yeah, at the time, I mean, culture shock maybe sounds a bit kind of like disrespectful when I put it like that, but it wasn't a shock in, in, in a negative sense, yeah. but it was something that definitely impacted me to witness when I was there. And that really kind of influenced the, the, thereafter my perceptions of how we discuss, you know, death and dying. So it was a very rich experience, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was my year in Mexico. So did you ever see the movie Coco? I did. I did. Yeah. yeah, that 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 brought me up to speed on some of that aspect of the the <laughs> culture and I was like, "Oh, okay." And yeah, so I I heard some, a little bit about it and then I watched Coco and you know, I've watched it like a thousand times thanks to my daughter. With your daughter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she likes the songs and meanwhile she doesn't get that uh, the adult sign and the different um, emotional space when they watch that movie. <laughs> 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 that is a fantastic movie. I, I love it. So, so good. But isn't it? Um, there's something also um, fascinating that uh, I, I don't know if you've seen Shang Chi, the the new Marvel movie. I am yet to see it, but I'm excited to see it. Okay, I don't want to spoil it for you, but yeah, no there's spoilers. a scene in the movie that mirrors from from Chinese culture that mm -hmm. mirrors some of what we just talked about. Because as soon as the grandma said something and they're speaking, uh, um, I think it's, uh, I think they're speaking, um, um, I think it's Mandarin they're speaking. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the grandma said that, I was like, huh, I would have thought this was Mexican. But you, 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 you relate to you, you catch it, you, you, you get it. You're like, huh. So uh, yeah. there's, there's another Chinese movie that, uh, um, well, a, a movie based on Chinese culture that I'm I would mm -hmm. like to see. Now I think it also stars Aquafina. Um, I think it's, it's mm -hmm. the farewell, uh, mm -hmm. the farewell, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Was that based on Chinese culture also? Okay, so I, I'll have to go check that movie out because uh, I heard it's very good. Yeah. Yeah, I, she's I, awesome. I, yeah, I, I want to see that movie now because after seeing Shang Chi and just that scene from the movie, and a lot of the movie is based on Chinese. Uh, mm -hmm. culture and heritage and I was like yeah so there might be there's something connecting with Mexicans too so okay. yeah wow so yeah you know I'm slightly know. off topic but um black history in in Asia including in China is mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to 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 speak about and to teach people about because a lot of people don't really know about black history in Asia oh yeah um, and there is so much. And it's kind of like the way that you found in Germany that actually, you know, Africans have been in that region for hundreds of years. It's the same across many, many Asian countries. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. So before we continue, we shall take mm. a quick break. And mm. um, we, when we come back, we're going to dive into more of your travels. And, um, yeah, maybe we'll even touch on Asia. But, yeah, we'll cover the traveling and then how you've been affected by the pandemic and all. Hi everyone, your host Raphael Harry here. I can't believe we have gone past our one year anniversary of doing White Label American. I've had the privilege of speaking with some amazing people, sharing their modern day immigrant stories. And you've allowed this Nigerian immigrant to share parts of his immigrant journey through this podcast. Also, one of my goals of this podcast is breaking down artificial walls that keep people from getting to understand each other. Based on your wonderful feedback over the last year, I think we have done a decent job in breaking down some of those walls. We would like to continue and expand on this mission, but we need your help. I've had an amazing time creating and producing episodes for this show largely on my own we have a lot of ideas for new and exciting content to expand upon the mission but we need direct support from you our listener which is why we have created a white label american patreon page where you can make a one-time donation or become a sustaining contributor where you can get access to exclusive content help me interview upcoming guests by submitting questions and even have the chance to sit down with me for a one-on-one -on -one conversation either virtually 
or in studio. So if this podcast means something to you, and if you really love this show, think about becoming a sustaining contributor and donating by going to patreon.com slash white label American POD. Thanks for listening and for the privilege of your company. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. So we already started in Mexico and uh, you did a year in Mexico. So um, when did you officially begin to um, go on tours to um, the rest of Latin America? Uh, and where was the first place that you went to? Did you start with Mexico or since you already had familiarity there? Mm. Um, great question. So I was just kind of bouncing around Latin America on and off for a few years, um, you know, like Colombia and Cuba and Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, different places. And um, I, I had been working freelancing on and off in London as a documentary researcher. And I did really enjoy it. But I was also I was every year I would spend months on end traveling as well. Um, so I would literally just save up my paychecks from my, tr my researcher jobs and then just go traveling around Latin America. And then I thought, you know, someone should really pay me <laughs> to do what I, what I'm doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So I kind of did a Venn diagram of my interests, which was, uh, you know, black people, <laughs> history and Latin America. And in the middle of that Venn diagram, um, I was like, well, you know, black history tours in Latin America. And so I reached out to a company called Afro Latino Travel, which if you haven't heard of them, 110% check them out, Afro Latino Travel. And um, they essentially, it's what it says on the tin. So at the time, um, so it's a, a pair, they are African-American of Afro-Panamanian descent, both of them. And it's Dash Harris and Javier Wallace are the two co-founders. And they were doing black history tours um, predominantly in Cuba and also in Panama. And so I reached out to them and, you know, basically said I speak Spanish and I'm into black history and I'm familiar with Latin America. And um, they very, very generously took me on board. And so I started off by assisting them doing their trips. And then I um, established my own trips in Colombia and also in Peru. And um, that was fascinating for me because even in the way, even the way in which we speak about history yeah. and the language we use, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how Europeanized and kind of like brainwashed I was. So when, you know, things like, for example, um, if you go to, you've been to Dominican Republic. So yeah. if you ever go yeah. to Santo Domingo, they have like the Zona Colonial, the colonial zone. And it's all like Spanish style architecture, these European style, you know, buildings. And um, you'll often hear tour guys say, you know, this was the first hospital um, in Santo Domingo, or this was the, the first cathedral or the first church in Latin America. And then it's like, no, it wasn't the first because there were in indigenous communities that were there. Yes. So why are we calling it the first just because it's white people doing it? And so it, it was really interesting. It was a huge learning curve in, for me in kind of how we present history and the language we use and the nuances we use. And even things like, um, you know, using the word slave mm -hmm. versus enslaved um, to an, acknowledge and appreciate that, you know, a slave is essentially a noun. It just reduces a human being to someone's property. Whereas enslaved, the word enslaved it's nuanced, but it's it very importantly recognizes that that individual is an individual with a name and an identity and a family, and mm. that being enslaved is a condition that has been imposed upon them, but it's, it doesn't define who they are. So even things like that, um, the language we use, that really kind of, you know, resonated with me. And I learned a lot from Afro-Latino travel. And to answer your question, I started with them end of 2018. Um, and obviously kind of the pandemic has put everything on hold and I've kind of moved on to other things now. Um, but yeah, it was a really, really special experience and I encourage anyone that's interested. And also one of the things that kind of struck, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but in terms of black travel, you know, the travel industry really neglects its black audiences. True. Um, and 
you know, we're spending money on traveling. We're, we're curious, we're um, intrepid, we're spending money on traveling. And oftentimes people are traveling to countries, you know, whether from Dominican Republic to Greece, to Italy, to wherever. And they want to know where they can connect with black communities and black history and invest in black businesses. Um, and so on that note, I just wanted to say that if anyone is kind of, I know this is like an international community that listens, if anyone is interested, there's a book called the ABC Green Book mm. by a woman called Marty Lewis. Have you heard of it? Not sure if I have. The, my database is picking up the Green Book for yes. traveling within America. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of based, the, the, the name itself is based off of the Travel Green Book. Um, but the ABC Travel Green Book is kind of like a modern, I guess, version where there's a lady called Marty Lewis and she spent many years um, documenting the different diaspora communities abroad around the world and black businesses Oh, wow. um, and black communities. So if you're going to like Vietnam and you want to know where you can get your box braids, yeah, just look in that book, it will tell you. Or if you're going to Yemen and you want to know where you can um, connect with the Muhammadin, you know, Yemenis of African descent, mm -hmm. it will tell you. So knowledge like that is really, really important. And I guess that's kind of like the flip side of what I'm doing because my YouTube channel is all about teaching the history yes. Um, yes. and the ABC Green Book. I think people should definitely look into because that's how you can connect with those communities and you can patronize black owned businesses now when you travel. Um, wow. so, I, yeah. yeah, I definitely need that book. Mm, it's a good one. Yeah, because um, yeah, I, when I travel sometimes, I'm like, yeah, there are definitely black people in this place. Where, where, you don't know where, where they are. And then I start searching on, you know, people who haven't thought about that, I ask them sometimes and they're like, oh, they, they haven't thought about that. So they don't know. And but like um, just from my recent trip to Germany and mm -hmm. I was in Havigsberg, you know, small village. And every time I go to the main city of Munster, I always see one or two black people there, you know, without an obligatory nod. When we see each other. Yeah, you give them the nod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's one or two who don't nod back and i'm like oh well maybe maybe you don't you, 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 you don't know your people yet or maybe you're brand new it's okay it's okay i, I don't hold it against you but um, my daughter needed um we, we forgot to pack my daughter's um, um conditioner for her mm -hmm. hair and she has coily hair mm. and yeah so she she needs special treatment for her hair mm -hmm. and um my missus said, "Let's check the 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 look um the main grocery uh the main store like the uh, mm -hmm. Walmart equivalent." There. And I was like, "Okay, mm -hmm. so we we'll go there and we'll spend a few minutes going around, and then she goes. She she knows what her daughter needs, so she 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 goes and she she's like, "Wow, they got this brand here." I said, well, "What brand mm -hmm. is that?" It's like the exact same brand we use in the states. It's made by a black owned um well a, a black." Um, I would say black owned company, but she's mixed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, it, it's here. And I wouldn't have expected to see this, but yeah. the, the, it, it's the same name, same company, but it, this the, the package is a little bit different for yeah. Germany. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, who, how you, yeah. you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have expected. I wouldn't have thought about this, you know, back now. I'm already bald now, back in the, you know. So I don't really think about hair products, but these are the things yeah. that I've started thinking about since I had a daughter. And if I had a son too, I would probably would have still been doing the same. But yeah. these are some of the little things that if where, uh, if I couldn't find it in, at the store, then I would have been like, where can I find something like this? Who, yeah. Who's Because exactly. I know the black people here get their hair done. So exactly. you, you get your cream, your conditioner, you get it from somewhere. So where do you get yeah. it from? And, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I don't want to just go start stopping everybody on the street. Like, hey, where you get this stuff from? You know, exactly. yeah, so, sometimes you know, I've, I've, at the airport, a, a gen black gentleman came up to me and he was speaking uh, French. And I was like, I didn't pay attention in my high school for French. So I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't even remember how to say the, 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 no, 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 no English in French. I was like, man, that, that just, is, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, so it's like no, I, I was like no, no. I was like, hey, why do you say no again in French? That even only we was the only French that was coming out of my. my I was like, damn. <laughs> okay, I was like nine, nine. And yeah. he's like, oh, um, uh, expression, uh, speech, speech, Deutsch. I said nine. 
uh, it's like this guy just knows all the nine today. <laughs> <laughs> I was like English. Oh, it's like ah, oh, and then he said nine English. I said, oh man, it's oh. not, it's not, no, we're not helping each other. And then his, <laughs> his, his kid had been, he had a teenage son who had just been watching two of us go back and forth like these two old <laughs> knuckleheads. And his, the son night decides to intervene as like uh, he's looking for what um, uh, he's asking, he's looking for change. Do you have change for five euros? Um, mm -hmm. Five euros or something. Yeah, five euros. Like mm -hmm. he had um, the, the note and he was looking for the coins. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I've, yeah, I, I forgot I was coming to Europe. So I only had dollars in my wallet. Oh, yeah, oh no. What did you do? No, I didn't. That's why we had been going back and forth over. We, I didn't have any change. But yeah, I was like, that's it. Oh, yeah. I thought it was something, <laughs> something a lot more. Of, and he's like, ah, oh, and he, he, he shows me. I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. There was money in your hand, actually. I was like, why are you bringing five euros me? I'm not, I, 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 I don't look like I need money or something. Or, you need money from <laughs> me? I don't, I, I don't get it. <laughs> but yeah, no, but so. that's actually really sweet. I mean, it goes to show what a global family we are. The fact oh, that yeah. he approached you specifically, yeah, it's, we're such a global family. And yeah, that was really like one of the things that I, I kind of, I hope I have um, reinforced with my channel is to show that you can be Indian and black, you can mm -hmm. be you know, Polish and black, but yes. we all have those African roots that unite us. Um, and as we were saying, to challenge the perception of what blackness is. Um, and I love the way that you said, you know, when we think of black history or black narratives, they're kind of more oftentimes um, confined to like the US or Canada, United Kingdom. Um, because on that note, today is a very happy day for me because it's the start of Black History Month in the UK. Oh, yes. Yeah, happy October. Black History Month. Thank you. We celebrate in October in the UK in ireland and in the netherlands we celebrate in october oh. i was in the state and in canada it's in february yes i wasn't aware that netherlands and ireland had uh, black history month too oh yeah every yeah. like most a lot of countries have their black history month belgium is in march oh okay uh, lots of latin american countries will have either a month like in argentina it's november um in bolivia it's september um oh, wow. you know, lots of countries will have their black history month but yeah, in the UK, we, celeb we celebrate October. So oh. happy Black History Month from to our UK listeners. <laughs> yeah, happy Black History Month to the UK listeners. Uh, I know I have a few people in the Netherlands and uh, my yeah. Irish. Because uh, Irish. my, my Irish um, guest, he, he's one of my most popular guests. So he still gets listeners from Dublin and beyond. So yes, happy mm -hmm. um, Black History Month to all of you. And um uh, yes, this will also come out later, but not today. But uh, so, but today is uh, we're recording on Nigeria's Independence Day. So happy Independence to my, mm. to my fellow Nigerian born uh, and Nigerian uh, citizens back home. Yeah, we have our issues, but you know, we, we I won't get there today. But <laughs> we have we have peace today. We have peace today. So yeah. celebrate. Today is a celebration. Make make enough jollof and invite me as usual. <laughs> I won't tell you who has the best jollof because um, I only eat it all. I You'll get in trouble. I, nah, I, 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 I don't take get part in the jollof wars. I, I come and eat and then I'm like, mm, next time, invite me again and then I'll tell you who has the best one. <laughs> yeah. That's me. <laughs> I've eaten, I've eaten jollof from about eight of the West African countries. I need to eat from all 16 of them before I make my final verdict. Yeah, you need to make an informed decision. Yes. This is empirical research. Yes, I'm doing research. <laughs> my, 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 one of my guests said it's Liberia. And they had, mm -hmm. they had, they had a, a, a competition in D.C. And there was five countries, chefs from five countries. I was like, only five, just five. And mm -hmm. they had the wrong judge because it should have been me. So, <laughs> see, that, that's where you all failed. Next time, <laughs> invite me. I taste it all. Mm. How, how many people here? You know, next time, add, add uh, yeah, the, the number should be 16, not not uh, five. Five. So <laughs> you're not doing a good job, people. You're not doing a good job. But add, <laughs> yeah, yeah, add more, add more, add more, add more in that plate. I'll take it, I'll take it to go. I'll take it for my daughter. It's for my daughter. She likes Jollof. Take so. some for me. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, I'm gonna flip the way I ask my questions because I normally end with some these two questions. But you know, there, there's something that um, there was an experience that I had uh, a couple of years ago. First time I went to Florida for a holiday was with one of my Navy 
brothers, and he he was mm-hmm. he's also a namesake. He's he's the you now he's the real Raphael, because okay. he he was born and raised Raphael, and uh, mm-hmm. apparently Venezuelans seem to love Raphael because even the first Venezuelan I've had on the podcast was also Raphael. And I'm like, y'all, y'all, y'all need to find another name to go after. Like, I, I don't get it. Why y'all just can't let me have my name in peace? But, you know. There's a word for that, you know. What? So when you meet someone that has the same name as you, mm-hmm. in Spanish, they say that that's your tocayo. 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 So mm. Rafael from Venezuela, he's your tocayo because you have the same name. Is, is that good or... No, I mean it's it's just a neutral neutral fact, but we don't oh. have a word for it in English. But oh, wow. I think it's cool. Okay. Like he's your tokayo because you're yeah. both Raphael. Uh, he, now nah, he's gonna get he's gonna get in trouble because he never mentioned that he was my tokayo. So he's, he's about yeah. to get. Now you can he, impress him. I, I'm gonna call him and be like, "You failed to tell me I was your tokayo all these years that we've known each other." He's gonna be like, "Oh <laughs> man, who, some, somebody put you up to this." <laughs> 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 no, nah, he's, he's my good buddy. I mean, his uh, mm. his daughter is, his daughter is my first niece in America. Oh. Yeah, so but she can't call me um, she can't call me my by my first name because it's confusing to her. Like, I'm, how many Rafa's are in this house? So <laughs> it's my, my last name. Oh, yeah, and, and his brother in is uh, one of his brother in laws also from Dominican Republic. Is um, also uh, Rafa too. So I'm like. God, there's, yeah, I, I love being the only Rafa That's in the true. room. But I'm the tallest. <laughs> yeah. I'm the tallest one in the house, so it's, it's fine. So <laughs> now I arrived in uh, Tampa, Florida, and mm. he picks me up at the airport. So he's like, "Oh, I have to go back to work. Um, there's nobody at home, but hey, I'm. You know, are you hungry? You need something to eat? Uh, there's food in the fridge. Just dive in. Get, get you know. So I was like, okay, well, you know, it's your house. Make yourself at home. I'm like, yeah, we, we've known each other for a few years. We worked very tight in the Navy. We called ourselves brothers. And mm-hmm. so he drops me at home, you know, he gives me the key. I open the, the, the dog, walk into his house, mm-hmm. open the fridge. I see something wrapped up in what looks like plantain leaves. And I'm mm-hmm. like, huh. Uh, this guy got my moin in here. <laughs> Where he got my moin from? So I open it and I'm like, wow, this is literally moin moin. So I take one spoon. Mm, wow, it don't, doesn't taste like my moi. It might, it might. It tastes like something I've had in Benin City. This, this is this is definitely made with corn. Mm. And then there's meat in it. Mm. But it does taste good. So I'm like, before I finish eating it, I know I was going to finish it, so I took a photo. And I probably ate like two or three. So I posted the photo on Facebook. And my Nigerians start commenting, Oh, Ben, where you get my moi from? Wait, wait, I thought you said you were going to Florida. Are you, are you in Nigeria or what? I said, no, I'm, I'm in Florida. Uh, it, it's uh, some Venezuelan food. Uh, I think it's called ayate. Or I, I, I keep forgetting the pronunciation. Ayate, something like that. Mm. Well, boy, you've been in America for too long, so you don't even know Moe Moe anymore. You've forgotten your Nigerian <laughs> food. What is wrong with you, man? Yeah, looking at Moe Moe. <laughs> I said, it's not Moe Moe. I am the one who ate it. I can tell from the taste. It does taste similar, but um, people in Benin City, if they taste this, they will probably know that um, it might taste similar to their food that they they have there. And there might be other parts of Nigeria that have something similar to it. And people started picking fights with me, like, dude, you don't know your food anymore. Oh, you've stayed in America for too long and all this and that, that. Yeah. So when he gets home, I, I tell him what's happening. He's, he's laughing. He's, he's just laughing. Like, why, why, why are your people fighting with you, man? Like, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think people would fight over this. But I was like, you know, it's funny how... The food, you know, that looks so much alike, you know. But I didn't even think put two and two together. Then that wait, how did this food even get there? How did they mm. get something that they wrap it? They cook it literally the same way we make moi moi, with difference that moi moi is made with bean paste, wow. and we use black eyed peas. And then um, in 2019, my Puerto Rican buddy um, mm. would invite me, like, oh, his family, they're doing pastales. And mm-hmm. uh, you, do you want to take part? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. Like, oh, you're going to walk, though. I was like, uh, will I eat? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll bring the kid and bring my missus, you know. You know mm-hmm. she, she's beginning to move around, you know. It's like, oh, there's music, there's food, there's drinks. No, oh, yeah, showed up. It was like, I've never seen so many plantains in my life. Plantains. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And the whole family, like, yeah, what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah. So I wash my hands, get busy. And I'm like, wait, yup. Making plantains, wrapping it in leaves. It's almost like making moi moi again. 
I'm like, this is what you guys do? I'm like, yeah. So it's like, where you guys get this from? Mm, yeah. We don't really know, but uh, but his dad is there, and his dad was like, oh, yeah, you know, we got African roots, too, you know? Yeah, just because yeah, we exactly. look light-skinned, don't mean we, we're not Africans. We got, we, we know African people, and I was like, wait a minute, Puerto Rico. So I never thought about Puerto Rico, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they keep Puerto Rico out of our mainstream until some disaster happens, then you do not realize, yeah, Puerto Rico is part of America, and... That's when I started thinking, wait, how much food in the Caribbean exists that, you know, I've seen in Africa, you know, and back home in Nigeria, a lot of the food. And then, you know, I started recalling that as kids, there were times I saw articles in newspapers that mentioned um, akara, which is the mm -hmm. fried bean cake. Being mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. some Caribbean, like in, I think Cuba has, they have a version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we use palm oil to fry it. Mm -hmm. Which technically isn't healthy for you, so I think probably now we should be using um, uh, the, the 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 vegetable oil or corn oil, you know, instead of uh, palm oil. But palm oil will taste better. I ain't gonna lie, it will taste better. <laughs> but yeah, your cholesterol woo, go up the roof, and it also damages the environment more too. Yeah, yeah. So say. um, there's still, but you see akara, you see the moin moin, they see the um. Um, um, my, my guest mentioned the other day palm butter soup, and I was like, man, all of that is like all scattered all over Caribbean into Latin America, and I was Latin like, America. the foods are everywhere, and we don't. We, I think that was another way that I could have realized much earlier that black communities were in these places that I, I, I never even thought about it. So that was a long way for me to get to the question, but I just had to throw that in there first. So, mm -hmm. from your being to all these Latin American countries, what mm -hmm. is the, the favorite food that you got, your, your go-to? Oh, such a good question. My favorite food. I tell you, Peru has some incredible food. Mm -hmm. um, I'm vegetarian, though, so a lot of it is quite, like, meat-heavy and fish-heavy yes. in Latin America. Um, but I do love Peruvian food, I have to say. And I wanted to also touch on the point that you made, which is that food is, a, is I mean, it's a, it's a form of resistance, you yes. know, in many ways. And um, so, for example, like anticucho is a Peruvian dish. I think it's like cow heart or like different parts of a cow, but not ones that were considered desirable. And that's like a key Afro-Peruvian, um, you know, dish. And when I take people on the Black, his Black History Tour I do in Peru, that's one of the things they can try. And we go to Black-owned restaurants with, you know, Black people um, in Peru. And it's because enslaved Africans, so during the slavery period in Peru, they were, enslaved Africans were obviously given the least desirable parts of the meat once the plantation owners, or for lack of a better word, the slave owners, um, had already taken their share of like the in quotation marks good part of the of the animal yeah um and so these afro-peruvians would take like the cow hearts or like guts or whatever other parts and then create their own dishes from those they would season them up and they mm -hmm. would create their own dishes and anticucho is one so it's like there is a story in the food like all the food that you're mentioning um these ingredients like you know the use of rice plantain um, you know, beans, all of these different African influenced foods have their own story and they are symbols of resistance. And I think oftentimes it gets kind of like blended in with the wider kind of mainstream cultures and cuisines in those countries. Yeah. But things like music and dance, like after this, Raphael, I'll send you a video of um, an Afro Peruvian family dancing. And honestly, you would think that they were from West Africa. Like, the way they look, the way they dress, the music they're dancing to, but mm -hmm. they're a Peruvian family. And so music, dance, religion, hair, yeah. all of these things are symbols of resistance that um, people don't even realize the significance of, uh, but that have survived, you know, these passages of time. So I really like the fact that you kind of picked up on that thread of the food from all of these different countries, because it's like, this has a story. There's a reason why, yeah. <laughs> you know, arrived at this place and you know food as a form of resistance um i think is a really really interesting one. Oh yeah uh last night i was um because yesterday was happy was uh was the pod international podcasters day so i was invited to a, a friend's uh um um platform uh club room in a, in a clubhouse 
And, you know, we're, we're all mostly African podcasters in the room. And, you know, so that it's something I, I used to say that a lot too back in the days. And used to be like, oh, I don't like American food because it's tasteless and we don't. And, and after seeing, I don't know if you've seen this um, documentary series, Taste of the Nation. No, we haven't. It's, uh, it's on, we, over here, it's on Hulu. So I think for you guys, it will be on Disney Plus. Yeah, okay. And it's, made me realize that a lot of the food, you know, you know, it, it does a great job of, like like you said, the, the, there's a story behind all the foods. Mm. And one of the episodes actually shows you a black community that still exists. And it started mm. from slavery and it exists in South Carolina. And they have their own Gula language. Gula the Gula 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 Gula. Yeah. Gula and mm -hmm. they, they have food. And they have, they have jollof. It was jollof. Yeah. They, they, one of the Very meals they made was jollof. And I was watching it and I was like, yeah, this is jollof. And when they were speaking, I found their Instagram page that I listened to a bunch of their videos. And I, if I listened to it for almost an hour, I understand mm -hmm. what they are saying. Mm -hmm. I start picking up what they are saying. And I'm like, yes, this yeah, is it's like our crew. So it's, um, but it's a lot faster. For any listeners that are interested in learning uh, Gulag Gichi language, they should check out Geechee Experience. Oh, and Geechee um, Experience. those are two uh, content creators. I forget their names now. It's one man and one lady, and they work together to teach um, the Geechee language. Geechee Experience, check it out. Um, suitable for kids as well that want to mm. learn. But okay. Yeah, exactly. Again, another form of resistance. And yeah. I actually have a video on them on my YouTube channel if anyone's interested. Oh, I haven't um, got into that. I'm, I'm, no, no. It's, it's yeah. Um, but they, yeah, super fascinating community. And again, it ties in, that was a great segue because it ties in really nicely to what we were saying about forms of resistance yeah. being things that you don't even realize. Yeah, that, that's what that um, docu-series is, is uh, hosted by Padma um, Laksmi, Laks I always butcher her last name, Laksmi. She's an Indian born, um, she's also a migrant from India, um, New York mm -hmm. based chef. Fantastic woman, um, and yeah. I, well, one thing I love about her is she is not like most some chefs who like you know pretty on TV. So they make food and you don't really see them eating the food. She eats everywhere she goes, and oh, she gets like and she's like mm, I'm eating, I'm enjoying it, and you can tell on her face she's enjoying the food. And it's yeah. not like because there's cameras, that I'm enjoying this food, so it's like street food. But <laughs> when you see the like the episode that they did at the, uh, the border town, El Paso, which is literally at the border town with Mexico. And you see the guys coming from Mexico to come walk in Texas mm -hmm. and then go back home. And you see the foods that they're giving us over in America and we eat. And you see the people who they're working for. And they, were, they were racists who they were working yeah. for. And, they, and the racists were on the document. They, they're talking and they're like, oh, I've voted for Trump, but he ain't doing what I wanted him to do. And it's not like, I don't, I want my workers to come work, but it's not like, but you like, but you want the wall to stop them, though. But you right, you, you, there's yeah, exactly. And Doesn't you see no all sense. those little details. And she doesn't just. It's not just like a gotcha moment, but it's the history goes beyond that, and it shows you into the mm. present. It's a beautiful documentary. But each episode is like a different uh, community that she picks and mm -hmm. shows you their food. So when it got to the Gichi community, I'd never heard of them until mm. that episode, and I was like, wait, what? Am Wait a minute, and I'll, I, I, that just made me start looking for um, the Gula Gichi um, community. A lot and of started, Americans don't know about yeah. them. I didn't even know it was I a recognized American... language in the United States. So it's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's now um, that that that's a recommended documentary that I always throw all the time. And so when I was in that room, and people were like, "Yeah, American food doesn't taste good. I don't recommend it. I'll go look for African food." I said, "Well, first of all, there's the Gichi are part of us too." They, they yes, are Americans, and you know, so and if you've yeah. been to New Orleans, um, the food is tasty. You got, I don't care where you're from, you, yeah. the food is tasty, and it's one way we, we we don't even realize how some of those languages are used to diminish black people here because you say, oh, it's not like why do the white people cook with food that that that's tasty, but where they get that, mm -hmm. they got it is black inspired. So, yes. but if you already start attacking all the food, saying the food is not the food is not tasty, then how will you be interested in tasting food made by uh, um, uh, American? 
who's black. And then mm -hmm. you're like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I only want to eat my African food. And I know people like that. So I'd, I'd like remind them like, yeah, I, I get what the point you're trying to make, but yeah. still be open to Short yeah, trying mm -hmm. everything because you don't know the history behind the food. If you know the history exactly. behind the food, you, you might even find out that it's related to you. It's from where you literally tie to where you're from. So yeah. it, I remember it, when I went to New York and I had soul food for the first time. Oh yeah. I used to be that guy. I was like, I won't touch soul food. I'm not doing this. I'm better. I'm then then I tried, but it was tied to an, a form of anti-blackness that I wouldn't even think about. Because when I start looking back to where the messaging came from, you know, it was people who weren't who were, who were dim, always diminishing black people that were mm -hmm. bringing the messaging to me. So why would I appreciate something made by black people? Yeah, you would. You, you would. internalized it, but yeah. it's really good that you had the self awareness to recognize that you did that. Oh, it took it took years, and then until I started listening to the Black Guy Who Tips, that's my favorite podcast in the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the husband and wife that they, they made me recognize a lot of my internal, um, yeah, anti black anti blackness, my toxicity. That I'm, a lot of it that I'm still removing, and yeah, so that's why I love meeting people like you. When I like. There was a time where I would have seen your content and be like, ah, why well, I want more black? I don't need more blackness. We, we, we're one. Yeah. We're one people. I don't need to know all this anymore. Move on. That kind of yeah. thing. But now I'm like, yes, it's a global history. It's part of us. We need to know and it should be out there. And I'll push it, keep pushing it and pushing it. And until, you know, there are people I've sent you, I've shared your videos with and they never responded. They're like, uh, I'm like, oh, that's a good sign. It's a good sign. Like, uh, <laughs> It touched something in you. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good sign. I I like that you, you you're scared to like mention anything now to me or something. I'm like good. Yeah. Because there are people like, how do you always know stuff about the country I was born and raised in? I was like, um, that's like my party trick now. When I meet someone, <laughs> I'll be like, oh, where are you from? They'll be like, I'm from Cyprus. I'm like, oh, here's some black history facts from Cyprus. <laughs> like that's how I get the conversation going. Or like Sri Lanka. I'll be like, oh, let me talk to you about black history in Sri Lanka. <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. So another question that I have to ask is, mm. um, you know, we, we hit food and I love that, you, you know, even as a vegetarian, you still have options. And I, yeah, Peruvian was the first, um, there's a Peruvian restaurant in my part of Brooklyn, because uh, I live mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, uh, Cocorivo, no, no, mm -hmm. Co yeah, Co Cocorico, I mean, Cocorico. Mm -hmm. I was trying to impress my missus first time we, uh, we, we, no, she was trying to impress me, I guess. Because on my birthday, yeah, I thought I was trying to flip it around. But on my first birthday that we spent together, she took me to Corico and was like, would you like to try Peruvian food? I was like, woman, I live. That's one reason why I moved to New York. I got food yeah. everywhere. And this neighborhood got almost everybody here. So, yeah, Peruvian. And it was good, right? Oh, yeah, it was good. It was good. I couldn't get Peruvian up. I couldn't get up, though. That was, that was the only... That was the Peruvian hits the spot. It's it, so good. It, 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 hit, it hit my soul. It hit my soul. It touched, it touched <laughs> me. I was like, y'all got me. I was like, oh, yeah. It was a transcendental experience. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, with all the, 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 the traveling, with all the communities you've seen, and you already alluded to this, because you said you sent me a video, um, mm -hmm. music, when it comes mm -hmm. to music, there's no way you can deny that you don't dance, because all my guests dance. You can dance yeah. in public, you can dance in private. We, 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 we accept it. But we need you to dance for over an hour. You know, we will just stick to an hour for now. We can go much longer. But when it comes to dancing, who are the, you know, give us three artists, at least three artists that can keep you going. And uh, we, I know we, we can go with Storm Z and we can go with those, you know, uh, um, with our grime artists from the UK. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do listen to a few. I, I got music from everywhere, so I'm I'm technically everywhere. Yeah, I was like, that's good knowledge. Yeah? But that, I think that would be cheating right now because based on what you do, you know, you got you've been giving us some gems from different places. So yeah, I think you you, you can hit us with something that we we'll probably haven't heard. What music that gets me dancing, yes. or music of African descent in different from different countries? Um, it, it's music that gets you dancing. You can you can you can merge both together, but Ooh, it's it's up to you. But it, it has to keep, get you dancing. It, it, you know, if you need to dance for an hour at least. <laughs> uh, if I need to dance for an hour, I do love me some salsa. I'm not gonna lie. Like I like to hit the salsa club. I might not be the best, 
but I get 10 out of 10 for enthusiasm. Okay, <laughs> I like that. We, 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 we're not um, doing the dancing with the stars, white label American episode. But uh, yeah. so you, 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 everybody gets a 10. Everybody who comes on the podcast gets a 10 over 10 automatically. Yeah. But yeah, give, a, give us uh, some salsa artists then. Salsa artists. Um, so I love some Celia Cruz. We got we to gotta go for some, you know, promote some black salsa artists yep. too. Celia Cruz, I love. Cuban national treasure. Um, I do love me some Mark Anthony, uh, Puerto Rican. Hey. Uh-huh. Um, Joey Arroyo, who's Colombian, Afro-Colombian. Um, Oscar de Leon from Venezuela. Oh, I know that name. Oh, like, I don't know. It just gets me going. Gets the people going. <laughs> I probably have his music. Yeah, Oscar you de probably Leon. do. Um, and then, I don't know. I do really love my Latin tunes. And I think that's one thing I appreciate about going to Latin America is that whether it's salsa, bachata, merengue, like everyone will just get up and dance. Mm -hmm. And the thing I really like is like, it can be intergenerational. So people will go to the club with their mom, with their dad, yeah. with their grandma. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's nothing strange about it. Like here, I would never, never <laughs> take my mom to the club, mm. but uh, why not? Like when you actually think about it, we should be encouraging people to celebrate and to share in that way. Like, it's, you know, intergenerationally. That's a great um, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I wish I was more. One thing I did not inherit was the Congolese hips that we spoke about before. <laughs> I, I was waiting for a Congolese artist or uh, you know but that's like yeah i mean everyone loves some fali pupa but i mean i do listen to i do listen to like sukus music and i enjoy congolese and actually a lot there's a lot of congolese salsa there's a lot of congolese salsa mm. because congolese music has influenced uh salsa rhythms as well um but yeah i i wish i had those congolese hips maybe it's a skill that can be learned i don't know it, it can be with <laughs> practice and uh, uh, as someone who's practiced a lot of Makosa dancing in in, in the dark, yep, yeah, um, I, I did. <laughs> yeah. After A Willow became uh, A Willow's album blew up ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Like till now, you can't have a Nigerian party without uh, Willow Longuba played once at least yeah. once. Yeah, otherwise, they, oh, somebody's gonna come. Who, who are you, this DJ? Who are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you won't you won't play. Uh, I, 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 I will, what is wrong with you? What is <laughs> bro? You didn't even play the DJ. You're not the one who played the DJ. Let the DJ play me. You know what? Play yeah, you won't play a Willow, you won't play Makosa, we'll be dancing to all these young young people's music, Wizzy, Wizzy, what whatever his name is. Play, play a Willow. <laughs> you know what blew my mind was when I found out that um Nigerians are the second biggest consumers of Guinness in the world. Oh, who, who's number one? Ireland. What? That is a that is a false. Oh no, Mark Mark gonna call me now and say yes. No 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 no. That I think that is faulty. That is a faulty um survey. I have no idea. That and is then a faulty. I, was... I thought Nigerians were number one. That is what we call Udeme. Well, that, I mean, it is an Irish drink. The, you see, like, the giant Guinness bottle. That that's that's what they would introduce us when 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 it's time for the boys to get into alcohol in my part of Nigeria. It was like, okay, come yeah. get Guinness and a bottle Seriously? of Coke. And, Are yep. you serious? Yeah, Guinness and a bottle well, of Coke. Raphael, I had no idea because obviously it's an Irish drink. I was like, "What's the connection to Nigeria?" And then I used to work in a bar, and uh, it was a Nigerian um, family that had hired the venue for the wedding, a wedding party. Mm -hmm. The Guinness they had crate. People were taking crates of Guinness to go, like when they got the Uber yeah. home. They that's that's the wedding they should have invited me to, not the one that I came I, when I came to the yeah, UK. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was um what we call stainless, no alcohol. I didn't the guy didn't mention it in the in the wedding invite. I was like, I wouldn't have bought my ticket and flown down here. <laughs> Came in, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian. I was like, what Christian are you? All the Christians in Nigeria bought give us alcohol, even in America. I, mean, I came down here, there's yeah. no, no booze. And then I had we, no honestly. We go across the street myself thought... and a friend to get um we were in Birmingham and we went across the street to get um find a call and then we saw guinness and get to the counter <laughs> the, the clerk says um you, you you guys this is not the guinness you want and i was like what 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 yeah. what, what do you mean are you, are you insulting me do you know why i'm trying to like i came all the way from new york man it's like no 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 you guys look like you need nigerian guinness 
Oh my god. And I'm like, wait, you can tell I'm Nigerian? He's like, yeah. you guys need Nigerian Guinness. This, this Guinness is not a Guinness for you. Go, go back to the refrigerator. The next refrigerator has Nigerian Guinness. And oh, I was like, man. oh, wow, Nigerian Guinness? I thought I was in the UK. I thought UK will have yeah. Irish Guinness. I thought Irish Guinness yeah, would be yeah, the, yeah. The, the better one. Well, um, I fled. Oh, you know what? Thanks, man. Uh, now I became humble. And I went and yeah. grabbed the Nigerian Guinness. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Hey, here's a tip for you too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. So I, I went we back to the venue, up. and I was, I was like, wow, Nigerian Guinness. And that was the first time I learned that. And by the time yeah. I returned back to the states, oh, everybody. Now my, my Irish boy came on the podcast. Yeah. He, he was like, no, no, no. I was like, no. Did you bring Nigerian Guinness or you brought Irish Guinness? He's like, well, uh, I'm like, bro, you gotta take that Guinness back. We don't drink. Yeah, take it back. We don't want. We don't that. drink <laughs> Irish Guinness. We don't. It's like, but there's three Guinness factories in the world, Nigeria. Um, in Dublin, um, oh, I on. think Lagos and Accra. I'm like, who counts Accra? Come on, yeah, nobody counts that. <laughs> that that's an, I'm like, that, come on, be serious, man. Will it count too? Will it count too? Like, uh, <laughs> even when my Ghanaian body came, he brought it's like, oh, it's Ghanaian Guinness. I'm like, who the hell talks Did about that? It? Did you taste it? It was Nigerian Guinness he bought, he just claimed it was Ghanaian. Even oh. Ghanaian, <laughs> Ghanaian sell Nigerian Guinness. I don't do patriotism, but on Guinness, we have to just go with that. It's Nigerian. So yeah. This is so you're gonna be you're gonna be judging the jollof rice competition and the Guinness competition. Uh yeah, on the Guinness side of things, um, I'm I'm old now. I'm, I'll admit that I'm getting I'm old because I drink <laughs> two. When I was younger, you know, one day, okay, I, this is the crazy story. When you, <laughs> when you move to Portacot in my neighborhood, you know, especially on my clothes, the clo I lived on close seven, Alakoya Estate. When you new dude showed up, the way they tested you was, um, you know, they, they would just gauge you and around my mouth, yeah, especially when the boys run your mouth. They're like, uh, "Do you drink alcohol?" I said, "Oh yeah, man. You know, are you how, 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 how much do you drink? Oh, I, as many as possible, really." So they, they took me out drinking. I didn't have money on me, and it's like mm -hmm. they always know the day you don't have money, and then they will take you drinking. Hey, you want <laughs> big Guinness? They brought the big Guinness. Like, oh, and they will serve you. Oh, customer service. Wow. They fill up my glass. So I take one sip. They fill it up. I take one sip. They fill it up, and I'm Dangerous. like, uh, "It's, it's, it's. It, 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 uh, can I get pepper soup? Oh no, we don't buy food for you. Well, we only buy the Guinness. So yeah. I'm like, okay, another big bottle, two big, more big bottles. I'm like, hey, how many bottles are you buying? They're like, oh, you say you drink as much as possible, right? So we, mm -hmm. we, we're gonna see how much you drink. So I'm like, okay, can you, can you stop at four? I don't even know if I can <laughs> yeah. make it up to three. So, uh, yeah, and they're like, well. If you can't drink it all, well, you have to pay for the bottles. <gasps> so I'm like, uh, yeah. And now I'm struggling to stand up. I'm like, oh, <laughs> man, maybe I should have I, I told these guys that I drink a lot. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're like, uh, so you don't really drink a lot. <laughs> okay. uh, I was like, uh, yeah, I, I have to eat humble pie that day. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, it happened to a whole lot of us on that street. Like, all the senior guys always got us. Like, oh, you drink? Okay, come out. I mean, oh, that yeah, was like initiation. Yeah, that was the initiation. Yeah, no, but I thought, after that, were you guys friends? Oh, we, we, that's the crew I, I hung out with till I left. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> it yeah, was the, worth it. The, the next morning, yeah, I threw up that night everywhere, and then next morning I wake Imagine. up, they show up with a bottle of Guinness. Like, you still want to drink? Ah, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I quit <laughs> drinking alcohol even. You don't so, even want to look at it. Yeah, so now it's like uh, I, I can judge Jalof. But if mm -hmm. it's Guinness, um, yeah, I stick to the American size of bottles, and it's, it's smaller. <laughs> yeah. two, two, two at, at most two. And if I want to really enjoy my Guinness, give me palm wine. Palm okay. wine with Guinness. Now, if you drink that, your third eye will even open. It might open. <laughs> so, yeah. If you're trying to make babies, that's a whole yeah. That that that's something that yeah. You just do that. You might you might make triplets <laughs> even. So. Yeah. Don't don't quote me. You can name one of the babies after me. It's still alive. <laughs> yeah. But I accept checks. I rather accept the checks. Yeah. <laughs> you got all the side hustles going after yeah, this yeah. episode. We accept. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's nice. Like, yeah, I, I, I come with the phone too, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's one of the funny things about. Uh, uh, learning and uh, growing back then. Oh, uh, mm. uh, now that I've mentioned uh, palm wine, that 
in in your travels, did you notice any community having something like that? Like that in what sense? Palm wine. Have you have you, have you ever come across palm wine? No, I've not tried it. So um, it's gotten from the palm tree, but it's it's like it's it's like the sap from palm trees, but fermented. It's fermented, mm-hmm. but um, if you get it fresh, like over here, it's it's been preserved. Put they put it in a bottle, but back home, it, it's um, it's in a gourd, like a, it's a calabash, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you add the the, the it's like an open air um, joint that serves it. So you just go sit down there, and the, the palm wine tap has brought like sometimes if you if you time it right, you literally then when they just bring the fresh batch and you just yeah. get it fresh and it's like if if you re- if you go t- online and search um, medicinal value of palm wine, that would be that's like the best booze you can drink. Oh really? Yeah, it it has a lot of medicinal values, like for. I have um, to say. I'm not a big, I mean, I do like a drink, um, but when I've traveled like in Latin America or like in the Caribbean, I'll mainly drink rum. Yeah, yeah, they have some good rum there. Really good and yeah. cheap as well. Yeah. Drink responsibly, folks. Yeah, I'm drink not responsibly. Like... <laughs> I'm not, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't quote my name if you go do something. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. palm wine is um, the only drink that the most ev- evangelical person in my family, who if you mm. visit her, She's like, yeah, well, this house is a Christian house. We don't buy alcohol for anybody. That was the only drink she makes an exception for. Like she, will, she, yeah, she will be like, okay, you, you, you can bring. She won't buy it for you, but you can bring it to her house. You can bring it. Yeah. Is it sweet? It's uh, yeah. I think it depends on the tree and maybe the okay. ground I've grown. But I've I've tasted a sweeter version. But mm. I've uh, it normally has a sour, not not like sour, strong sour majority that I've tasted. And mm-hmm. I think the more fermented it is, uh, I think the more sour it gets. But not like it's mm-hmm. not like a strong sour. I don't know how to really describe it because all the ones that I've, I've I drink now, it, it, it's it's changed the way I I, I you know, the way I, it tastes to me. So, mm-hmm. but I I know if I go back home, I I know in Nigeria and Ghana, it's very common. I'm probably sure Cameroon, Togo, Benin. I'm pretty sure they have it around all the coastal areas. You can get it in the coastal areas. Do you think areas. if I go to like a West, excuse me, a West African supermarket in London, they will sell it? They should have it. It's in a green. It's always in, in green bottles. Just if they are, you just ask for palm wine. Yeah. It, so it's preserved for it to be in. They, they preserve it to put in bottles. But if you ever go on the coastal part of Africa, yeah. uh, West Africa. Because Eastern Africans don't seem to know what I'm talking about. Every time I ask them, they're like, <laughs> like they're like, what language is that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You haven't spoken to the gods yet. When you when you're ready yeah. to, to the gods, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, that's the 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 only alcohol that I 100 percent stand behind and say, yeah, I, I recommend people drink that. Oh because, my. Yeah, it's as a medicinal value that it, it adds a lot to to. You to call people. me so curious now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Look, you you're a researcher, so you you you. You'll find good stuff about it. Yeah, you might yeah. even teach me some uh, stuff about it too. So I'm gonna do some empirical research of my own. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um beginning to wrap it up, uh, with the pandemic happening, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it pandemic changed a lot for many people, uh, myself mm-hmm. included, although it, it forced me to evolve in a positive way. Um, mm-hmm. how has that affected the way you um you know, go about your content creating and also your your tour, um, your your tour, the tour side of your work. Um, really interesting question. So obviously, before I before pre pandemic, actually, when the pandemic was really kicking off worldwide, I was in Dominican Republic trying to organize a Black History tour there, and I also had flights booked to Turkey because I was oh, in wow. touch with the Afro Turkish Association to try and organize a tour there. Um, and everything just got put on, put on hold. I came back from Dominican Republic and we just went straight into lockdown in the UK. And it really kind of forced me, because I had really been hinging my hopes on doing, expanding these Black History tours. Um, and it really forced me to kind of like recalibrate. And that's when I put the majority of my efforts into the YouTube channel, which only started last year, um, before we went into lockdown. But 
it was very it was in its embryonic stages at that time yeah. and it really forced me to kind of like put my energy into that and to really commit myself to the research process and look at all these different countries and look at black history in those places um and so it's been now obviously i'm back to work full time I have a full-time job and a part-time job so I'm super like busy but I still put out the content and um yeah I think the pandemic really kind of it gave me it for similar to you it kind of forced me to sit down and then to channel channel my energy into a kind of a creative pursuit but also an educational one and it's probably the same with you with the podcast as well like you you know you've really kind of expanded that in, in that time period so yeah it was an interesting one for sure but um I don't know we'll see people keep they ask me all the time like when are you going to start doing your black history tours again and I'm like I would love to do it tomorrow but it's at the moment I just don't feel like it's quite safe and mm -hmm. it's difficult for me to travel from the UK and ultimately if we have to travel somewhere and spend two weeks in quarantine just to do a five-day tour it doesn't make any economic sense. That's true. It's a little bit too soon, but hopefully, hopefully next year we can get up and running again. All right. Mm. I wanted to, um, before we wrap up, wrap up, I yeah. wanted to, because obviously you're a, a Navy veteran and I wanted to give you some interesting, a nugget of uh, Navy black history knowledge. Sure. And sure. that is, I was in the, the National Archives, British National Archives a few weeks ago. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, uh, a sailor called William Brown. William Brown. Uh, so I mean, I've met someone by that name too. Yeah. Oh, well, well. <laughs> this William Brown was the first documented black woman to oh. serve in the British Navy. William. And William Brown, okay. because at, in this was back in 1815, in 1815, uh, women were not able to serve in the Navy in the UK. It was men only. And um, so we don't know her birth name, um, but she chose the name William Brown. And basically, she entered the Navy by pretending to be a man. Wow. And there's two written accounts of her life. Um, so one is an article which came out in 1815 in two different magazines. Um, one was the Times and the other one, I can't remember the name, um, annual something. And those articles, there's, there, these are the two conflicting accounts. So one was that she was in the Navy for like over 10 years, that she was a really well-respected officer, um, that she, you know, rose in the ranks, that she was very, very skilled, um, at her job and well respected and they called her uh, a female african even though uh, oh. we think she was actually um caribbean and uh yeah so they did this whole article about her and she said that she'd had an argument with her husband and run away and decided to join the navy and so had kind of like adopted this persona as a man called william brown but then it was kind of an open secret that she was a woman but you know a naval officer and then the other account, which is in the National Archives, which where I went a few weeks ago, are the muster lists from the ship that she served on, which was the Queen Charlotte. And in the muster list, it has her name written as William Brown uh, from Grenada. So she's from Grenada. Um, and it says that she was discharged after a couple of months. Um, and it says in writing, and I took a picture, for being a female wow so she got kicked out the navy for being a woman so those are the two written accounts of her life from the time the first-hand historical sources mm -hmm. but i just think her story is awesome like it is <laughs> when it is. i get married if my husband annoys me i'll be like i'm gonna do a william brown and join the <laughs> navy <laughs> wow. and apparently she made good money as well so oh okay that's uh oh, that's good movie material right there then yeah, yeah it was amazing because you know i was I read about her story online and then i actually ordered up the document when i went to the archives and just to have that book in my hand with her name and you know where she had signed and it says a discharge for being a female wow. that's amazing black history that it is, is top-notch black history really? so yeah and it's very appropriate that today is um black history month in the uk so we celebrate her story even more oh yeah so, wow, I think we'll end there because that's just, wow, that blew my mind away. 
I'm pretty sure I met a William Brown in the, the while, I was, while I was in the U.S. Navy, and yeah. that that's uh, that's I met lots of Browns. It's a very common yeah. name. It's uh, there are lots of Browns, uh, black Browns especially. Oh yeah, there was there were so many Browns that I met, but I'm pretty sure I met William Brown. But now it's mm. like, I'm like, man, I wish I, I could meet another William Brown. I have to go check my Facebook now if there's any William Brown on it. <laughs> Do you I, remember the name for when people two people have the same name? Do you remember the word? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, um, Tokayo. To, no. Yeah. To, Tokayo. Yeah. Tokayo. Well done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I wrote that down so that I don't forget. <laughs> yeah, you can meet a William Brown Tokayo. Uh, and then if you do meet a William Brown Tokayo, you can tell them the story of the William Brown, the, William the first Brown. black woman to serve in the British Navy. The ultimate William Brown. That's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I can't thank you enough for giving me your time and coming on the show. Um, I do get lots of thank yous from um, all my guests, and I know how to say gracias, which is one of my um, one of the first thank yous that I learned after moving to the United States. Well, before I moved to the United States, I knew how to say gracias. But um, one mm-hmm. of my favorite thank yous that I like saying now is just uh, one of the recent ones that I just got, which is uh, Barang. It's from um, the Manjaco tribe in the Gambia. And wow. um, yeah, so I love saying that Barang a lot. So Barang for coming on the show. And so final question. Mm. What would you like to leave the audience with? You know, it's a freestyle moment. Um, you know, make it yours and yeah, bless us with something. Oh, damn. So I think that's a, such a good question. Wow. Um, so I think because you and I are both content creators and it's something that we kind of, you know, we got into because we wanted to be able to teach people and to share stories with people. So I think it would be appropriate for me to encourage anyone that's listening that wants to be a content creator. One of my favorite quotes of all time, because I think oftentimes people psych themselves out of it because they yeah. think, oh, what if you, they, they want something to be perfect before, mm. when they start. And so I always say, um, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. And so if you're thinking about creating content, whether it's about, you know, Africans, the African diaspora, wh- whatever it's about, it could be about food, music, travel, anything, just um, start where you are use what you have and do what you can and just go for it and share it with the world. Wow, this, this, that was my uh, mic drop. Yeah, it was a mic, that was a mic drop. That was a powerful <laughs> one. I was just thinking about how many things you've said today are so in sync with where I was yesterday, uh, last night. And because mm-hmm. we we're a bunch of um, African podcasters on the platform and there were also people who were in the process of starting a podcast and there were people who were thinking about one and, you know, somebody just put that question of, you know, I'm thinking about, um, yeah, and I'm just like, I know where you are and I know, mm-hmm. like, stop thinking, just, just start, just do. you know, just, do. <laughs> just, you know, um, I get it with this. You want to buy equipment, you want to this and that. I made that mistake of buying a whole bunch of equipment and I, I've never used them. You oh, don't, really? yeah, because I don't need to. It's mm. because the moment I I did I did I didn't even do basic research, you know. And mm-hmm. when I did basic research, I found out there was a studio. I prefer working at the studio, and then I found out there was also another facility that you could go to. It's a public facility, it's like a public radio facility. They actually teach people who want a podcast and all that, so they provide that service. You pay like five or ten dollars. You and then you can have access other stuff. The public library gives you access to world-class facilities two, uh, twice a month. You can make mm-hmm. video, uh, audio content there. You just need yeah. to have somebody who knows how to edit. So there's mm-hmm. different options. And that's why I tell people, like, you don't have to say I must spend $1,000, $2,000. There's so many options. That's why you talk to people. And that's why people can say, start. And but what if I don't sound perfect from the one? You'll never sound perfect. Yeah. You'll never. But the more you keep... Releasing content, be consistent. You get better and better and better. I know people who've said, "Oh man, you sound a lot better than when you started." Yes, I wasn't gonna sound like the way <laughs> I'm about <laughs> yeah. to hit 100 episodes now. I did not yeah, sound the like same I way. So. Yeah, at, at, at um, episode one, I sound different from you know episode 20. I sound different at episode 50. You know, mm-hmm. you grow, 
you grow. So it's a process. For I sure. tell people, it's like, yeah, you're on a journey. So you get exactly. better it's and better. It's a process. So, and yeah. I 100% agree. And for me, like, I just started making videos in my bedroom. I have, you know, no mic. I just used the cheapest camera I could find. And I didn't know how to edit. I was just watching YouTube tutorials on how to edit. Yeah, and then, you know, a, a year and a half later, here we are and I'm speaking to you. Sweet. So it just goes to show, like, I, I, I really second what you said. Um, you don't need to be throwing money at it. You don't need to have everything perfect and have all your ducks in a row. Just start. So, yeah, exactly. that's what I want to leave people with. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And I know people who are making podcasts using WhatsApp for their recording. They ask, I don't know how they do it. And I'm like, but I give them kudos. I'm like, you yeah. figured it out. That's the way. I'm like, yeah. it's you, you at least you you're doing something. I like the pro- I know and I know someone who the person has bought is literally building a studio in his house. One year has gone by. I'm like, dude, when is the content coming out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah but you know, I still want to buy this. I want to buy that. I'm like, okay, well, all right. When you when you're ready, we'll talk. <laughs> In your own time. Yeah, your own time. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't thank you enough again, um, mm. Barang. And um, plug in, um, you know, how can people get in touch with you? You know, I, I'll tell people Freedom is Mine channel on YouTube. Go check it out. But I, I, and I'll also um, add that to the uh, show notes and tag it on social media. Mm. But uh, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for people to do that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so as you as you said, Freedom is Mine is the name of the YouTube channel. I have a website with a blog also. I'm on Instagram. So please hit me up on Instagram because we are posting three times a day, every day, Black history content from around the world. Um, so you can hit me up on Instagram, YouTube, um, Facebook, and then email address is info at freedomismineofficial.com. Um, so feel free to drop me an email. But yeah, I just really, and if people have ideas for content that they want to see, whether it's a country or it's a person or an event or whatever, um, then please, I'm always open to suggestions. And oftentimes viewers will get in touch with me and be like, have you heard about this person from history or, you know, um, you know, in my country, there's this black figure that's really revered and i'm like oh i had no idea about this story so please please get in touch freedom is mine um and i'd be very happy to hear from you and also i just want to say thank you Raphael, for having me here and for it's been honestly so much fun and it's you know it's been more of a conversation even like a back and forth which i really appreciate so thank you for having me here and you know we we appreciate what you're doing we appreciate you giving a platform for these stories and these voices so yeah thank you very much that's the plan that's the plan is to make it a conversation and that way everybody can grow and everybody can learn you know so thank you again and to everyone listening don't forget to go give us five stars Keep the positive reviews coming in. And if you want to join us on Patreon, you want to get our t-shirts, yeah, go on Patreon, join us. Um, go on vetclothing.com. You'll find our t-shirts there. Yeah, keep the support coming in. Keep the love coming in. Thank you for the privilege of your company. See you next week. Thanks for listening to White Label American. If you enjoyed the show, we'll appreciate if you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from if you have any questions comments or have someone who will be a good guest on the show or you want to be on the show send us a message at white label american at gmail.com and make sure to follow us on facebook and instagram at white label american thank you for your support